Well, the big money Democrats are not screwing around. One bit. Good morning. It's great to be here on a Tuesday on KCMO 95.7 FM as we get it rolling. Kamala Harris smashing fundraising records as the Democratic Party donors, both big and small, have opened up those wallets. Kamala Harris has raised $81 million in the 24-hour period since Joe Biden announced on Sunday afternoon he was not running for re-election. This is a tremendous haul, and what it tells me is basically the big money folks. Now, we can talk about the small money, where that's coming from, where it's not. But the big money folks on the Democratic side of the aisle basically got Joe Biden out. They told the powers that be, there is no way that we are going to support that guy based off of that debate a couple of weeks ago and based off where the polling is right now. Now, the problem is the polling is not great for Kamala Harris either, but they believe that with their friends in the media and hundreds of millions of dollars, they can make Kamala Harris acceptable to the American people. And guess what? A lot of advertising dollars can do just that. Now, they have a problem. And that's, of course, that Kamala Harris in November of 2019 was polling worse than Andrew Yang. Do you remember Andrew Yang? John will, because um, our former associate producer on this show, of course, a job that's now manned by the great Mark Van Sickle, was a guy named Matt, and he loved himself some Andrew Yang. Yang He was a Yang ganger. You guys remember the Yang Gang? Oh, yeah. UBI, maybe. That's right. That's right. Universal basic income was Andrew Yang's thing. And uh, we had an associate producer on the show who loved himself some Andrew Yang. Now, if you go back to November 20th of 2019, Democratic primary voters. This is a national poll done by Emerson, one of the big national polling outlets. Joe Biden was at 27%. Bernie Sanders was at 27%. Elizabeth Warren was at 20%. Mayor Sweet Pete was at 7%. Andrew Yang was at 4%. And Kamala Harris was at 3%. You can't pretend like that did not happen. That was a thing. Kamala Harris spent months in front of her own voters. And 3% of them thought she should be the nominee. And that's why she never made it to Iowa. She never got to the first primary state. So what you've seen over the last 24 hours is incredible propaganda. I mean, it's like state-run TV. It's amazing. I mean, you know, you look at it, and somewhere Kim Jong-un is wondering why North Korea can't do that good of a job with their state-run television programs. The media, which spent the last four weeks doing decent journalism and just crushing Joe Biden, or at least calling a spade, a spade, are now back to their old ways of fluffing up Kamala and the whole thing. So you're going to see much more of that going forward here in the days and weeks ahead. They're back to state-run television. And the reality is, the more the American people do get to see Kamala Harris in public, because she's more or less been in hiding behind Joe Biden, I don't think it's going to go well for him, but they will have hundreds of millions of dollars in the coffers to spend to try to get her across the finish line. So then the question is, what does she do with this vice presidential nomination? There are four leading Democrats who have emerged, according to the Associated Press. And one of these guys I saw on television last night, he's the governor of Kentucky. His name is Andy Bashir. He's one of them. Uh, The other guys on the list, Roy Cooper, who's the outgoing North Carolina governor. Obviously, these are all Democrats. Mark Kelly, the Arizona U.S. senator, one of the Arizona U.S. senators, uh, who is a veteran himself. And then Josh Shapiro, who is the governor of Pennsylvania, who did have himself a good moment last week in the wake of the shooting when he called for unity and turning down the temperature. But none of these guys are rock stars. But they are the four best options from a, you know, disappointing group of options. And that's not a partisan comment. That's just a fact. And here's some of the problems they have with each of these guys. So Josh Shapiro may help Kamala Harris in Pennsylvania, but he doesn't help anywhere else. 
And by the way, being Jewish, which he is, is going to turn off the pro-Palestinian crowd in Michigan, which she theoretically would also need to win. Roy Cooper, North Carolina, probably doesn't even get him North Carolina and helps nowhere else. Mark Kelly, Arizona guy. Do you really think a California-Arizona ticket? Kamala Harris, of course, formerly a U.S. Senator of California. Do you really think a California-Arizona ticket could win in places like Pennsylvania and Michigan? Andy Bashir, governor of Kentucky. He's an unknown, doesn't even get him Kentucky. And by the way, J.D. Vance is also from there. Gretchen Whitmer is also getting talked about in Michigan. I mean, two woke ladies on the ticket, uh, that's electoral death. And then, you know, Mayor Pete's also getting a little bit of love. But I think, frankly, in this election, um, that's not the route you want to be going down. The biggest place they're struggling with is men. I don't think a Kamala Harris, Mayor Pete ticket helps you in any way. In fact, it probably just hurts you with men, which you are dramatically struggling with right now. And no more needs to be said there. So last night on CNN, they're trotting out some of these VP candidates. I see this guy, Andy Bashir on. And first off, he just, you know, some people just look uncomfortable on television and kind of have that deer in the headlights look. And he certainly had that look as I'm looking at him last night on TV. And then on top of that, you know, he's given you some of the corniest lines you could get written by Hollywood. Let's roll Andy Bashir from last night on CNN, Kentucky's governor. They're grasping for straws. Listen, J.D. Vance is a phony. He, he's fake. I mean, he first says that, that Donald Trump is like Hitler, and, and now he's acting like he's Lincoln. I mean, the problem with J.D. Vance is he has no conviction. Okay. Uh, that J.D. Vance has, I mean, you can say a lot of things about J.D. Vance, but he's got no conviction? I, you know, that, that's probably a stretch from Andy Bashir, But if you watch the guy last night, that's some of the stuff that he was saying on CNN. And then he had this incredibly corny line where he talked about, uh, you know, convicted felons and uh, Donald Trump's got 34 felonies and the whole thing. So that was one of those deals I was watching last night and saying to myself, you've got to be kidding me with this guy. It's weird. It's awkward. Um, you've got to see the video for yourself. There's no way that he's going to be the pick. And that's what it was last night. It was a job interview on CNN. But if there's one of these guys you had to pick, and none of them are great options for Kamala Harris, but if there was one of them I had to pick, it would be Mark Kelly of Arizona. It would be the senator from Arizona who is, yes, a veteran. Um, He's an astronaut. He's built a brand as a moderate in a state that has long supported Republicans. He's done very well in that state of Arizona. It's not that he delivers it, but of all those options— He's the guy who I would roll with. And if not him, you'd go with Shapiro, try to win Pennsylvania, and then take your chances elsewhere. But Bashir, I'd cross him off the list, and I'd also cross Roy Cooper off the list from North Carolina because I don't know what exactly he adds to the ticket, if anything, at all. 913-4087-957 as we get it rolling on a Tuesday morning on KCMO. Now, speaking of TV appearances and press conferences, yesterday, Clark Hunt owner of the Chiefs, addressed the media. Where is he at on the stadiums and how this whole thing is going to play out in the months ahead? He gave us some insight, and the insight from the owner of the Chiefs has an interesting tidbit to it that we have not been talking enough about. We'll tell you what it is next on KCMO 95.7 FM. Well, there is a uh, new angle to address in the Chiefs future stadium plans that we admittedly have not spent nearly enough time on. And that is the possibility of the Kansas City Chiefs building a new stadium. But that new stadium being in the state of Missouri. What have all the conversations been for many of us since that vote went down on April 2nd? The Chiefs are either going to end up staying at Arrowhead in some capacity or they go out to likely KCK out in the Legends and they build a new stadium out there with these um, junk bonds. Sorry, the star bonds. I always, you know, get that confused. But what about staying in Missouri and building a new stadium there? 
That is not something we've spent a lot of time discussing. But Clark Hunt from St. Joe yesterday uh, talked to the media extensively. He did about a, a 10 minutes of Q&A, and he talked about this possibility. He talked about the idea of not just renovating Arrowhead, which is obviously something that's gotten a tremendous amount of attention, but also on the idea of potentially a new stadium. Here's what he said about a new stadium versus maybe, say, renovations to Arrowhead. Uh, over the next several months and, and coming years, we'll be looking at whether we're better off in a renovated building or in a new stadium. And that new stadium could be on the Missouri side as well. It doesn't have, have to be on the, on the Kansas side. Um, I, I had a bunch of season ticket holders come up to me today to share how special uh, Arrowhead was, is with them. And Well, that's something that when I hear, you know, Clark Hunt say what he just said there. Obviously, you know, he's got fans coming up to him and talking about how special Arrowhead Stadium is, and we all know that that's the case for any of us, whether you've been going for, you know, 50 years like John or half a dozen years like me. I think there are many that can vouch that perhaps more recently than in the past. (laughs) Touche, says the season ticket holder from 1985, right? Yep. But there's no doubt about it. Winning, you know, obviously helps your fondness for any arena, any stadium Mm -hmm. when you're going and you're seeing AFC championship victories in those stadiums. That's a very fair analysis there, John. (laughs) But as I'm looking at and hearing Clark Hunt there, he brought up something that really has not gotten any discussion. A new stadium in Missouri. Now, what would that look like? That would obviously be, I imagine, in the parking lot of Truman Sports Complex, which, you know, the Royals are going to be leaving at some point. Where they go, who knows? But you're potentially going to be in a spot where you could just build a new stadium right next door. And that happens all the time in baseball um, and in football. Uh, you know, you go anywhere in the country, and oftentimes if they're going to build a new stadium on the same location, they'll just build it in the parking lot um, of where they're currently at then they'll knock down the old stadium and that will become the parking or more parking, I should say. It becomes a mess for a couple of years, but it's how many teams have done it. But that's something that really has not been part of the conversation here, um, at least amongst the public, in recent weeks since the April 2nd vote, where suddenly now you're possibly looking at a third option for the, for the uh, Chiefs. First option, and I'm not listing these in order of any kind of significance, but... First option, stay where you're at, stay at Arrowhead, and ultimately end up you know, just fixing up Arrowhead, which is what they had talked about doing before the vote in April. The second option, obviously, is going to Kansas and you know, using those star bonds to move ahead with some plan out by the Legends. And now there's a third option, which is staying at Truman Sports Complex, but building an entirely brand new stadium. And I try not to look too much into how people say things, but it is part of the job. And when I hear the tone in Clark Hunt's voice as he's talking about, yeah, the fans tell me they love Arrowhead, but, you know, we've got to do what's best for, you know, the future of the team and the community and things like that. I'm sensing a guy who might be a little bit over Arrowhead. And I never have heard that before when he's spoken. We know that, of course, the stadium is his late father's, you know, prized possession. But I'm sensing that Clark Hunt may be more open to that new stadium than he was before the vote on April 2nd, as he reevaluates his options and as he looks at this thing and says, well, you know, maybe that brand new stadium is actually the best play here. And he also went on to say this about, you know, whether or not he wants a uh, renovated Arrowhead Stadium. You were consistent in saying that your preferred uh, outcome was a renovated Arrowhead. Uh, do you still feel that way? Is that, is that your desired outcome? Uh, you know, uh, we're really approaching it with an open mind um, and not, we don't have a desired outcome. Uh, we just have to find a, a solution uh, that works for the community and something that works for the club. All right. Well, that, once again, he's not going to tell us how he feels. He's better off keeping his um, cards close to the vest, so to speak. So he's not going to be like, yeah, this is what I really want to have happen. But the minute, it's kind of like when you're in the market for a new vehicle or you think it's time to get a new car. Once you set your mind to it, you know, you're going to do it, whether it's Mm -hmm. the right move or not. You guys agree with that? 
Oh, yeah, and you can fix it up and say, well, I got some new tires. I got some cool new wheels on it. Put in a new stereo. You know, you can fix it up, but it's, mm-hmm. you know, you can only go so far with that before your value drops, right? Exactly right. Yeah, exactly so right. right. And yeah. and certainly they've done um, quite a few upgrades to Arrowhead since it opened, so not sure how much they more have. You, you could do. Mm-hmm. Absolutely right. And that's where I think Clark Hunt, after that vote went down on April 2nd, we really haven't heard from him. But the feeling I'm getting in watching all 10 minutes of his Q&A yesterday is a guy who I'm just sensing now wants a new stadium. And the question is, which side of the state line is that new stadium going to be on? I would stay at Truman. You've got all the infrastructure around it. Everything is in place that you need. You don't have to worry about highways, um, you know, figuring out all the different ways to get into a ballpark. You've got that all set up perfectly where it is. The Royals are going. That area is now yours. You have the gift of that entire complex to yourself. You've got a practice facility. Stay there if you want the new stadium. If you can figure out a way to get the new stadium, then... You've got yourself perfectly set up for that, John. Yeah, I think, and we give the Chiefs credit. I will give the Chiefs credit for being at least team players to try to help the Royals get that whole thing, you know, all across. But that's all in the past now. And with that being in the past, we will just zero base our expectations, right? And uh, yeah, you know, no, it, it, they don't. You know, I'm giving them credit for trying to help the Royals and say, okay, well, we'll spruce up Arrowhead and improve the fan experience, and here's a few things, right, mm-hmm. and put that on the ballot. So they they did their part there. But now that all bets are off, so to speak, let's just start fresh. Yeah, they got to go at it separately. And, you know, they tried to be you know, team players, so to speak, as you noted there with the Royals, but they couldn't drag them across the finish line. Let's be uh-huh. honest. Uh, they couldn't do it. The back to back Super Bowl champs could not drag this thing across the finish line, and it wasn't even close. And it wasn't just because of the Royals' plans, it was also just because of how incompetent this county has been for far too long. But now, keep an eye on a new arrowhead exactly where they're at and that is something that before yesterday was not getting very much conversation 913-408-7957 already a uh, busy first hour here on kcmo talk radio 95 7 fm and streaming on the kcmo uh, talk radio app this is a story that will get more attention in the weeks and months ahead but how exactly the last few days played out. We still don't have, obviously, really all or any of the answers. But this report came from uh, the New York Post yesterday, and it says here, per their sources, operatives at the very highest levels of the Democratic Party threatened Joe Biden with forcibly removing him from office unless he stepped down. As they call it, the well-orchestrated palace coup to stop the faltering president from seeking re-election had been in place for weeks. The insider also made clear the anger, paranoia, and frustration Biden displayed as the party elite circled around him and piled on the pressure. It was real. On top of that, here's something they noted. They said here in this report, part of the elaborate strategy to remove Joe Biden from the race, as he announced in a shocking letter, which was posted, obviously, to X on Sunday, was allowing him to debate Donald Trump last month live in Atlanta. Basically, it was part of their setup. And then, since then, as the calls have continued for Joe Biden to bow out, which he did on Sunday, the party bigwigs threatened to invoke the 25th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which would allow the vice president and members of the cabinet to declare he is unfit to serve and force him to step down. And that would have obviously been an incredibly embarrassing moment for Joe Biden if they did threaten him with the 25th Amendment. So here's the amazing part, though. If they don't think he's fit to serve right now, if they were willing to invoke the 25th Amendment, how can they let him hang on for another six months? And still nobody's answering that question and nobody's seen the guy for the last several days. It might just be about COVID. He might just be licking his wounds. But I I don't know. The whole thing is just weird to me that we haven't seen him. All we've done is heard from him in this, you know, audio clip where Kamala's at the podium yesterday and, you know, he's on a phone call and he's like, I got your back, kid. It was very strange. So it's not clear to me what is exactly going on here. 
But it's one of those things where, I mean, the last three to four weeks have been so beyond unpredictable, I'm done trying to figure out why. All I know is that it all stinks, and nothing about it right now is making a whole lot of sense. But it's also amazing that Joe and his inner circle, like Jill, his family, if you can't trust people in politics, I get it. But how they let him go out on that debate stage, June 27th in Atlanta, and thought it was a good idea, is just stunning to me. It tells me that the people in his direct inner circle, like his wife, one, they're not looking out for him because they allowed him to embarrass himself in front of the world. I, like it, it, that, Leave the politics out of it. His wife allowed him to be embarrassed in front of the world. That is inexcusable. He could have called off that debate the day prior. He could have made something up. He's sick. Something happened. He can't do it. You could. I mean, it wouldn't look good, but it would have been better for him than what ended up happening. Joe would have been better never stepping on that debate stage if he truly wanted to run for re-election and be the nominee. He should have never debated. He should have said, you know what? Trump's a convicted felon. We don't debate convicted felons in this country. This is wrong. I mean, you know, just something made up like that. It would have been better off for him. But the arrogance to me that he thought he was going to get up there and in any way impress the American people is just still unbelievably stunning. 913-408-7957. The hearings yesterday, of course, getting an incredible amount of attention from the Secret Service. Uh, You're wanting to chime in. Let's go to uh, Josie in Kansas City. Josie, you're first up. Good morning. You're on KCMO. Hi. Good morning, Pete. I just want to make a quick comment. I don't trust anything that's going on in Washington right now. And there was part of this whole issue with this hearing yesterday. I watched two hours of it. But Jill Biden was in Tennessee or somewhere, and she was having this big gala event, and they had 12 Secret Service on her detail, and they only had three at Donald Trump's rally. That came up, and Joe Biden said in an advertisement that he wanted to put him in a bullseye. And then, uh, you know, I think what what is really going on, and this is just my opinion, is that the Secret Service director was trying to set up a scenario where President Trump wasn't secured so that an accident would happen. And I think that the, the Democrats that were in the hearing yesterday, I think they're publicly coming against her because they didn't agree with the plan of advertising that Joe Biden put forth. And I don't think it's because they're trying to be bipartisan. I think yeah. it's just Josie. extremely correct. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Listen, I, I, I cannot at this point, listen, I think there's a lot of nefarious stuff that goes on at very high levels of government. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that's, um, you know, over the top at all. I can't put that on Kimberly Cheadle right now if we get evidence of that. Obviously, that is a total game changer, um, but I can't put that accusation on her plate at this point in time. I understand why many want to. I just, I need more, a lot more to get there. But certainly incompetence, at the very least, is what is going on here. And we do know the Secret Service has been short-staffed. We do know that Donald Trump had a lot of people from DHS. Um, They were not necessarily Secret Service agents uh, who were there uh, working with the Secret Service. So, yeah, all those things are absolutely problematic. And there's no doubt about it. It almost cost Donald Trump his life. 913-408-7957. Josh in Plattsburgh. Go ahead, Josh. Got a minute for you, buddy. Good morning. Yeah, I'll make it quick. Uh, She... uh Cheadle just seems like the kind of person that has a glass case in her house with all of her participation trophies, with her lack of confidence, her massive confidence and her lack of capability. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, <laughs> that is so well said. In fact, one of the most dangerous combinations, Josh, as I'm sure many of us can attest to, you know, working in any kind of office space, is the overconfident, overconfident, I should say, overconfident, incompetent employee. The person who is so confident they think they know what they're doing, but they're actually just an absolute fool. 
that's what I'm getting more of a sense of when it comes to Secret Service Director Kimberly Cheadle. There's no doubt about it. And yesterday was just an utter embarrassment for the Secret Service from start to finish. And that's why she got called out by both sides of the political aisle yesterday in that oversight committee hearing. Now, uh, Laura Kelly, the governor of Kansas, came out yesterday and endorsed Kamala Harris to be the Democratic nominee for president. Laura Kelly, as every Democratic governor has done across the country over the last day and a half, put out a statement endorsing Kamala, saying here at a time when our country is desperate to restore reproductive rights, strengthen the middle class, safeguard democracy, and bring people together, we need her leadership now more than ever. I'm proud to endorse Vice President Kamala Harris as our country's next president of the United States. That is from Laura Kelly yesterday afternoon. And, you know, we know what the blueprint is, right? The blueprint has been and will continue to be abortion democracy. One, two, two, one, uh, you know, throwing something about the middle class, even though no one's gotten crushed more by 20 percent inflation the last four years than the middle class who is not getting government handouts. But, you know, throw something in there about the middle class and boom, boom, boom. You've got your three boxes checked. That's what they're going to make this about. I don't know what safeguarding democracy even means. I I mean, if anything, you've got now a party that has subverted democracy. Now, I don't think that's something to be clear, like Republicans. I heard Laura Trump, top of the hour of the RNC, uh, saying somewhere yesterday, it's a clip that they used, that this is not how the process is supposed to go. And, you know, Democratic voters got hosed. They didn't have a real choice in a primary. Who cares? I, like, that's not your party, Laura Trump. Who cares? Let that be an issue that their own party figures out. Let the uh, voters in the Democratic Party, if they have an issue, revolt. And by that, I mean call their members of Congress, be annoyed with the process, speak out on social media, do those things. But Republicans being like, oh, this is unfair to the Democratic system, please. Who, who cares about You should not be caring about that. All you should be caring about is pointing out that Joe Biden's failures, which are many as you see it, are also Kamala Harris's as his VP. It's not like they picked her up off the streets and she can say, hey, none of this had anything to do with me. None of these ideas were mine. And that's the danger in going ahead with her that you can basically latch all of Joe Biden's failures, especially the border, which is issue number one or two by most people's estimations in the polls, it's one of those things that you just can't look at and say, well, that had nothing to do with me. Not only were you the VP while this was going on, but you were the border czar, (laughs) whatever that means. You were literally put in charge of the border, which is one of the biggest disasters of the last few years. But, you know, Laura Kelly coming out um, in support is not something that really surprises me because we've seen that from other Democratic governors in redder states like Kentucky, um, like Michigan, of course, with Gretchen Whitmer, like Pennsylvania with Josh Shapiro. So you've seen all this. It's not in any way a major surprise that Laura Kelly would go about doing this because also she's a lame duck anyway. So it doesn't really matter. It's not like she's up for re-election ever again. So she's going to come out. She's going to do what the party asks her to do because what they need now more than ever is unity. One thing that was clear coming out of the Republican National Convention last week is that the Republicans are, I would say, more unified than they've been in a generation. And yes, it took Trump nearly getting assassinated to get us to that point. But the unification within the Republican Party is unlike, I, unlike anything I've seen in my adult life. And the fact that it's happening around Donald Trump when there was uh, such you know, pushback against another Trump candidacy, a third straight Trump candidacy just a few months ago, is a stunning development. But the party that is unified puts itself in a great position to win. And right now, especially up until Sunday... Republicans had all the unification on their side. Well, now the Democratic Party is wisely, to their credit, 
trying to get some of that unification around Kamala Harris from not just party leadership, like Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, and others, but also at the state levels with the governors. But there still is one holdout in all this. And that holdout is Barack Obama, the most important person in all of this, has yet to come out and give Kamala Harris his endorsement and his blessing. Why is that? Is he waiting to see how she does over the next month before the convention? Probably. By the way, that's the smart thing to do. Maybe he's gauging his own wife's interest in all this. I don't know. But that remains the final piece of the puzzle if you want to talk about true Democratic unification right now around Kamala Harris. Here is my message to J.D. Vance. Stick to the script, brother, okay? You are less than a week in to being Donald Trump's VP selection. You're not Donald Trump. You've written a great book. You've had tremendous success before the age of 40. He turns 40 here in about a week and a half. And you might very well be a heartbeat away from being the president of the United States come January of next year. But stay in your lane, okay? Uh, J.D. Vance did his first solo speech yesterday, first solo rally in Ohio, where he's from. And, you know, overall it went well. But a lot of people think they can be Donald Trump. They can go off the cuff. They can just, uh, you know, riff like they've been doing radio shows for years on end, hours and hours a day. And the reality is, most of these folks obviously can't just riff. They're not good enough to riff. They haven't done it. I mean, I'm not sitting here saying we're uh, digging ditches and anything like that. We're we're not. But you have the ability, doing this four hours a day, as John and Mark know, to riff. That is part of the job, of course, by also making a point within your riff, not just riffing for the sake of riffing. There has to be a direction. There has to be a point to where you're going with all this. And J.D. Vance went off the prompter yesterday. And, I mean, it wasn't brutal. It's not going to come back to haunt him. But it was just that reminder, don't be awkward, J.D. And I get what he was going for, but it wasn't well done. It is the weirdest thing to me. Democrats say that it is racist to believe. Well, they say it's racist to do anything. I had a Diet Mountain Dew yesterday and one today. I'm sure they're going to call that racist too, but it's good. (laughs) I love you guys. (laughs) Okay. Okay, where are the crickets when I need them uh, for J.D. Vance? Okay, that was certainly awkward to say the least. Yeah. You can tell he's, he's reading the teleprompter there. He goes, it's racist to believe. And then he kind of goes off the cuff. They'll say me drinking a Diet Mountain Dew is racist. No, that's just really dumb, actually, because Mountain Dew sucks. But that's a different conversation, J.D. Vance. I'll save that for another day. Um, But, like, stick to the script. It's your first one by yourself. Look at the teleprompter and read the words. Once you've mastered that, once you get comfortable being in front of the live audience and speaking at rallies and to big crowds and doing things of that nature... You want to go off the cuff a little bit? Sure. But remember, Donald Trump's been going off the cuff for decades. TV star being interviewed, then having his own TV show, Mm -hmm. then doing this for the last eight years, John. I mean, Trump has prepared for this for decades. His riff is a decades-long practice. Giving corporate speeches and stuff, you know, for his companies, all that kind of thing. Yes. Right? Right. All those things. You know, you'll say, hey, we want to recognize uh, Henry so-and-so. Henry here, okay. You know, and you crack a joke, a one-liner here and there. You know, it's just part of the deal, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, Mm -hmm. Jimmy Fallon's already already monopolized the laughing at the own jokes thing, so we've we've had enough of that. Right? Right? Yes. He's always telegraphing the (laughs) punchline. (laughs) Yeah. He, he's a master of that. There's mm-hmm. no doubt about it. 
Um, so now, speaking of J.D. Vance, there is speculation as to whether or not he was the wrong pick for Donald Trump. And you knew this was coming, right? It was just a matter of when they would start having the conversation as to whether or not um, – J.D. Vance was the right pick for Donald Trump now that Kamala Harris is in and Joe Biden is out. Political writing here. With Biden out, Vance may be the wrong pick for Donald Trump. They write here, in part, if Harris is successful in getting the nod for the Democratic Party, much of the election campaign is likely to domestically focus on abortion and women's rights. By the way, says who? Yeah, they right. say here Trump already has a pro- like, who 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 is there's not a poll that suggests that's the top issue. The top issue domestically is the economy, inflation and the border like Politico can want it to be something else, but it's not going to be something else. And putting Kamala Harris at the top of the ticket doesn't change what the American people care about and what the biggest issues in their lives currently are. But of course, they go on to imply that because Kamala is a female at the top of the ticket and J.D. Vance is a guy and Trump already struggles with women, um, this could be more problematic. I would flip the script. I do think there's going to be an enormous gender gap in this election, maybe the largest we've ever seen, with men breaking for Trump and women breaking for Harris or whoever it's going to be. That was already the trend before Joe Biden dropped out. How is Kamala Harris going to make a dent in the mail vote? Instead of them saying, oh, boy, J.D. Vance, bad pick, bad pick. How are they going to get women on their side? Um, I would flip the script and say, how is Kamala going to get any guys or improve her standing with male voters? Joe was struggling mightily with men, and he is more appealing to male voters just naturally than Kamala is. So that's, that's the way the conversation should be looked at. Because right now, the polling that has come out since Sunday, since Joe dropped out, is that Trump still has a slight lead nationally. So the question is, what is Kamala going to do with certain groups to improve her standing to win the election? If the polling shows Trump's ahead, and obviously polling you take it all with a grain of salt, but if it shows him ahead, then how's Kamala making up ground? And the biggest gap right now, regardless of um, skin color, is just the male to female gap. She's got to make up ground there, and it's not clear to me how she's going to go about doing it. Was J.D. Vance my number one choice? Uh, No, I told you that last week. But I don't think much changes with Joe dropping out and Kamala stepping in. If anything, it might help Trump with the male vote even more.